so hey everybody and thanks for joining um we've got i think almost or maybe even over 40 people on the call so it's a little sad uh, to have this culminating event not be in person um, but i think this is more than would have been able to attend otherwise so that's a bit of a silver lining uh just real quick uh, i'm going to use my all-powerful control here to mute everybody. Um, I will do questions at the end. Um, if you have one before the end, feel free uh, to type it in to me on Zoom and I'll uh, get to it uh, at the end of the conversation, uh, or you can use the little um, hand raising icon. Uh, I've also sent everybody the um a link to a youtube link uh if you have uh internet issues or some sort of technical difficulty on your end uh go to the youtube link um it's the same talk just pre-recorded okay and so with that uh the long-winded title of my dissertation is the underlying mechanisms governing buying printability for extrusion-based bioprinting and application to their generation of bone and tooth tissues. I'm gonna start with a little bit of background on myself. I did my undergraduate at the University of Delaware in exercise science. Uh, I got my first experience of research there studying blood flow to the brain with Dr. Rose, uh, and then also spent a year in Dr. Zenny's physical therapy lab looking at movement asymmetries after hip and knee replacements. Uh, I came straight from there to Wake Forest and the Joint Biomedical Engineering Program with Virginia Tech. Uh, I studied cadaver biomechanics in the Center for Injury Biomechanics, uh, in particular looking at pelvis fractures and spinal fusions under Dr. Brown. Uh, in addition to my graduate studies, uh, I've been fortunate enough to have been funded by Wake Forest Innovations, which is our technology transfer office. Uh, and through them, I've worked on the design and commercialization of uh, novel medical in, uh, device inventions uh, over the last five and a half years. Uh, after my master's thesis, I began work here at the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine under Dr. Sang Jin Lee, and that research is what I'm gonna to cover today. So this is a slide that's very stereotypical for our field, uh, but I think it does a really great job of underscoring the magnitude of what's at stake here. Uh, there's an enormous gap between the number of people on the organ transplantation list and the number of donors. We've become increasingly talented at keeping very sick people alive for extended periods of time, but our talent for dying prematurely, fortunately, has uh, remained relatively stable. There's also a great need for tissues not captured on this list because they aren't typically transplanted, such as bone, cartilage, skin, etc. Regenerative medicine is a translational field of science with the ultimate goal of generating or regenerating tissues and organs. In addition to transplantation, these technologies have also been used to create high throughput mini organoids, uh, which can be used to study both normal and pathological physiology. Uh, bioprinting uh, gets a lot of attention, uh, but when it comes down to it, it's just a manufacturing technique used for regenerative medicine. It uses the same technology as regular 3D printing and applies it to materials which contain cells. The basic template for regenerative medicine strategies is to use some combination of cells, signaling factors, and or biomaterials. Uh, the biomaterials, uh, which are most often hydrogels, provide the mechanical properties to the constructs, uh, provide attachment sites for the cells, and serve as delivery vehicles, both for the cells and for signaling molecules. Both the biomaterials and signaling molecules can be used to regulate the cell behaviors, and the cells themselves lay down tissue, which in a perfect world becomes the organ or tissue you're attempting to regenerate. For bioprinting specifically, uh, the combination of these materials are called bioinks. The main limiting factor to bioprinting technology is the lack of bioinks which are available for use. And this really shouldn't come as a surprise because we really ask a lot of our bioinks. 3D printing is a complex process and places the material under some extreme circumstances. And after that, our materials still need to perform long-term uh, with cells, which can be highly sensitive. Uh, in general, we can take the requirements we place 
on our bioinks and categorize them into one of two categories, their biological properties and their printability. In general, biological properties are what happen after printing. Uh, this can be either in vitro cell culture or after implantation in vivo. Uh, things like, do our cells attach to the hydrogel matrix? Do they lay down uh, extracellular matrix, which is similar to our target tissue? The biological properties matter a lot for the ultimate effectiveness of our tissue regeneration. And they matter regardless of what manufacturing technique is used. Uh, <clears throat> whether that's 3D printing or something else. So as a result, many techniques have been developed and standardized to measure biological activity. At this stage, we also have developed a lot of biomaterials which have good generic biological activity and improvements are needed on the tissue specificity. And what I mean by that is we have bioinks which can support cell survival, growth, and attachment, uh, but precious few which specifically target the regeneration of a given tissue. On the other hand, printability refers to the performance of the bioink during the printing process itself. Uh, there's a good bit of disagreement and inconsistency with the term in the literature, and it can uh, vary uh, depending on the application. But for us, we primarily want to know if our material can be extruded with minimal damage to the cells, and what shape does the bioink take after deposition. Unlike biological properties, very few methods have been developed to analyze bioink printability. Um, however, in both cases, we have a very limited understanding of what drives printability and biological properties. We've done a variety of work over the last four years looking at the printability and biological activity of our bioinks, uh, with the ultimate goal being to improve the bioinks we have available for use in bioprinting. Uh, the first of which is to develop a methodology for assessing bioink printability. <clears throat> uh, and this work spanned several different projects, uh, including the first three of which I'll cover today. Uh, we also use this method to study some of the underlying factors which impact printability. And lastly, we've developed bioinks with tissue specific bioactivity uh, and I'll present an application of that to bone and tooth tissue regeneration. So our first study is entitled Optimization of Gelatin Alginate Composite Bioink Printability Using Rheological Parameters, a Systematic Approach, and it has been published in Biofabrication. In this study, we wanted to investigate how the mechanical properties of a bioink affect its printability. Uh, bioinks are viscoelastic materials, which means they have both viscous and elastic components, uh, both of which can be measured on a rheometer uh, through a process that's called, referred to as rheology. Uh, the elastic component is measured as the storage modulus and represented by G prime. Uh, this can be thought of as the solid-like behavior of the bioink. <clears throat> uh, when a force is applied, that energy is stored and returned once the force is removed. Uh, the viscous component of a bioink is referred to as the loss modulus denoted by G double prime. Uh, this is the um, liquid-like component of the bioink. Uh, when a force is applied, the energy is dissipated and lost. Most bioink characterizations focus on storage modulus, while loss modulus is often overlooked. Uh, further, the ratio between the two uh, is referred to as the tan delta, and this also has not been examined with respect to printability. Uh, we use gelatin and alginate, uh, two common hydrogels used in bioprinting as our model materials for the study. Alone, the materials demonstrate complementary characteristics. Uh, as gelatin concentration increases, its storage modulus increases dramatically uh, with little to no uh, loss modulus. Alginate, on the other hand, actually has a higher loss modulus than storage modulus, both of which increase with <clears throat> increasing concentration. So by combining the two of these, uh, we can get a range of different bioinks which ha all have similar storage moduli, uh, but range uh, dramatically in their loss moduli and therefore also their tan delta. Uh, first, we looked at the extrudability of the materials, uh, which has major implications for total print time and the viability of cells. 
Uh, we used a wide range of combinations of gelatin and alginate for this experiment, not just the storage modulus controlled combinations. And what we see here is that uh, storage modulus and loss modulus are both related uh, to the pressure required to achieve a given flow rate. Uh, in fact, when we fit a model to this data using a first order interactive equation, we see that both storage modulus and loss modulus uh, <clears throat> contribute to extrusion pressure with loss modulus contributing slightly more for this data set and the interaction term between the two having almost no effect. Uh, in fact, when we remove this interaction term, the uh, fit of our data actually improves, uh, which indicates to us that the contributions of storage modulus and loss modulus to extrudability are independent of one another. We also developed two methods to look at the filament uniformity and shape fidelity of our biolinks uh, using the storage modulus controlled concentrations. And we see clear trends with tan delta. Uh, we measured uniformity as the perimeter of a single filament normalized by its length. So a uniformity ratio of one uh, would be indicate perfect uniformity. And we see as tan delta decreases, uh, the uniformity decreases with a transition occurring somewhere in this 0.27 to 0.43 range. Uh, we also measured shape fidelity. Uh, we did this by printing a five layer tubular structure and measuring its height. So as height uh, decreased, the, this indicates the shape fidelity decreased. Uh, because the filaments collapsed after deposition. And again, we see a trend with tan delta, although this time in the opposite direction, a higher tan delta resulted in decreased shape fidelity with the transition occurring in this 0 0.27, 0 0.43 range. Uh, so with these results, we proposed a printability window where increasing storage and loss moduli both decrease the extrudability of the material. Uh, and then further, we bound uh, this printability window on the lower end with tan delta, uh, which results in non-uniform filaments, and on the upper end, uh, which results in poor shape fidelity. But of course, uh, when we try to apply this window to other biolinks, uh, it failed completely, and tan delta predicted neither the uniformity nor the shape fidelity of other biolinks besides our gelatin and alginate combinations. So ultimately, uh, we're forced to be a bit narrow in our conclusions. Uh, our results definitely show pretty clearly that both storage and loss modulus contribute independently to extrudability uh, and that we see better shape fidelity with low tan delta and better filament uniformity with high tan delta. Um, but as far as specific ranges, <clears throat> um, these results only apply to gelatin alginate formulations. Uh, while we're hoping to cover more broad findings, uh, as often is with science, we are left with several interesting questions instead as a consolation prize. Um, namely, if it's not tan delta, what are the uh, rheological factors governing printability? Uh, we also wanted to know if we can improve upon our novel printability measurements and what other non rheological factors might be at play. Uh, so we've taken our first step into developing our methodology, <clears throat> uh, as well as examining rheology as a factor which impacts printability. Uh, next, we're going to develop this methodology a little bit further uh, and examine the effects of printing conditions and cell concentrations. So this study is tentatively titled uh, The Influence of Printing Parameters and Cell Concentration on Biolink Printing Outcomes, and we plan to submit uh, for publication soon. For this study, uh, we used a combination of gel and gum and gelatin methacrylate biolink. Uh, gelatin methacrylate can also be referred to as gelma. Uh, first, we tested this biolink uh, using a testing matrix of different flow rates and feed rates on the bioprinter and evaluated these outcomes uh, using the same five layer tube structure as before uh, and an additional crosshatch structure. One of the key additions to this study is that we automated our image analysis process uh, using a MATLAB software rather than making each measurement manually like we did for the first study. 
For experiments in cell density, uh, we added MS1 fibroblast cells at varying concentrations and also uh, conducted rheology. And then we also evaluated their printability with the same methodology. Uh, the printing conditions that one uses are critically important to the end result in bioprinting applications. Uh, these can affect the, everything from the total print time to the cell viability to the final shape and size of your structures. However, uh, most often these are just chosen by trial and error or personal experience. Our researchers rarely take an optimization approach to the printing conditions and very few attempts have been made uh, to model the effect of printing conditions on final printing outcomes. The studies which have been done on this area <clears throat> only look at very simple measures, uh, such as single filament height and width. Uh, but in application, we print much more complex structures than this. And additionally, while they examined feed rate and flow rate, none have looked at the interaction between the two known as speed ratio. So flow rate is the rate at which a material is being extruded from the nozzle tip. Uh, feed rate, also known as print speed or scan speed, is the rate at which the uh, print head is moving. So how fast is the bioprinter going? Uh, the ratio between flow rate and feed rate <clears throat> uh, is known as the speed ratio. And you can see here, uh, when you divide flow rate by feed rate, you're left with uh, units of area. <clears throat> uh, and that's the, this is because it's the, uh, actually the hypothetical cross-sectional area of your printed filaments. And you can see with this testing matrix that we can get similar speed ratios, even though vastly different feed rates and flow rates are being used. So when we actually uh, printed uh, using this testing matrix <clears throat> and our gel and gum gelma bioink, uh, what we found was our lowest speed ratio, and uh, we could not make any measurements from these structures because of under deposition. And at our highest speed ratio, we could highest two speed ratios, we couldn't make any measurements due to over deposition. So really, there was just too much or too little um, material, and the structures came out looking nothing like what we actually intended. Uh, here you can see qualitatively the results for our remaining uh, combinations. Uh, we can see that the structures uh, seem very similar within a speed ratio. And then also that as we increase speed ratio, material deposition also increases. Uh, returning to our five layer tubular structure, we measured both height and width. Uh, height we looked at in the first day I showed you, but width was, the, was a new addition. Uh, height showed a dramatic increase with increasing speed ratio and width also steadily increased, although more moderately. Uh, for this study, we also imaged the five layer tube from above. From these images, we measured tube wall thickness uh, as well as radial accuracy. Uh, radial accuracy we expressed as a percentage of the designed radius, which in this case was four millimeters. Uh, between speed ratios, radial accuracy changed very little remaining between 95 and 98 percent, which amounts to only 0.12 millimeters. Um, some differences were detected between different speed ratios, but there weren't any obvious trends. And then wall thickness increased dramatically with increasing speed ratio. Uh, we made two measurements from the new crosshatch structures. First, uh, this PR value, which looks at the shape of the pores and was developed by another lab. Uh, this did not change between speed ratios with PR values consistently at about 1.1. Uh, next, we looked at the size of the pores in terms of their area. Uh, and as, we, as you might expect, uh, the pores got a lot smaller as speed ratio increased. Uh, now, those results were pooled together from all the different feed rate and flow rate conditions. And if you remember from the testing matrix we used, some of the conditions had vastly different uh, feed rates and flow rates, even though they had the same speed ratio. So we wanted to look uh, within the speed ratios to see if feed rate and flow rate had any independent effects. So looking at these plots, um, a cluster of bars uh, represents different feed rates within the same speed ratio. And then the pattern of each bar, uh, it corresponds to a specific feed rate. 
Uh, we see here that the trends hold across speed ratios, but really within speed ratio, uh, within a speed ratio, we don't detect uh, many differences between different feed rates. Uh, this is true both for the uh, five layer tube viewed from the side, as well as wall thickness and radial accuracy viewed from above, as well as the shape and the size of the pores um, on our crosshatch structures. So moving on to cell concentration, this is another one of the many parameters which researchers must select for when designing their experiments. Uh, cell concentration has major implications for the final outcomes and biological properties of the constructs. Uh, one open question for tissue engineers is, how do you put an upper ceiling on cell concentration? Uh, there's a variety of factors that can do this depending on the specific situation. Uh, what we wanted to ask here is whether or not printability should be considered one of them. Uh, previous researcher studies have looked at uh, rheology with some finding the cells to affect the bioink <clears throat> while others have found no differences. Uh, these studies have often only looked at narrow ranges of cell concentrations. And it's also important to point out that rheology does not necessarily equal printability as we saw in our first chapter. So we printed a bioink with 0, 5, 10, 20, and 40 million cells per milliliter. And what we found was essentially no difference. Uh, all of these measures that we took, uh, none were significantly different. Only pore area came close um, with potentially this acellular, the zero, the zero concentration of cells uh, having a slightly lower pore area than um, the other groups. Uh, however, we looked at their rheological properties uh, as well and did find some changes. Storage and loss moduli both increased slightly at 20, starting at 20 and 40 million uh, cells per milliliter. Loss modulus or yield stress also showed similar changes, although in the opposite direction. Uh, and the shear thinning abilities of the bioinks remained relatively unchanged. <clears throat> um, so what can we take away from all of this? Uh, first off, speed ratio dominated the printing dimensions. Uh, this is largely something we could have predicted intuitively, but sometimes it's good to test your assumptions. And we also now have quantitative data for more complex shapes to show this than we did before. Uh, it's also important to note that despite the dominating effect of speed ratio, it's rarely reported in the literature. So typically researchers will report pressure and feed rate, uh, but this data shows that including flow rate and or speed ratio would be really helpful when attempting to reproduce the results from others. Uh, we also saw that within speed ratio, feed rate had very little effect. Uh, this conclusion seems likely to apply to other bioinks. Uh, but caution should be used in this case as we only tested a single bo model bioink, our gel and gum gelma formulation. Uh, we also shouldn't ignore that we did st statistically detect some differences. Um, these could have been the results of variation in our bioink or measurement technique, uh, which we need to look into further, but they also could represent true effects. Uh, lastly, two of our measures were largely unaffected by feed rate, flow rate, and speed ratio. Uh, because of this, radio accuracy and PR uh, value might be, prove to be particularly good measures of material properties instead. With cell concentration, we saw no effect on printing outcomes. Uh, our findings are again limited to our gelma gel and gum formulation, uh, as well as to cell concentrations at or below 40 million cells per milliliter. Uh, a very recently published study, uh, the results seen here, suggest that cell concentration can affect printing outcomes in a collagen solution, uh, but it seems reasonable to expect that the cells might affect printing outcomes in weak ungelled bioinks, such as the one used in this study, but that these effects are drowned out by the relative contributions uh, of the hydrogel in stronger pre-gelled bioinks, such as the one used in this study. Uh, rheologically, we did find differences between our bioinks, although they were relatively minor. <clears throat> and to me, this says simply that Rheology is a more sensitive measure than our crosshatch or five layer tube structures. So ultimately, uh, what these findings indica indicate 
is that at least for pre-gelled bioinks, printability is not likely a limiting factor when selecting which cell concentration to use. Okay, so we've just made some minor improvements to our printability assessments. Uh, namely, we've added a few measures and automated our image analysis process using a MATLAB software. Uh, we also took a look at feed rate, flow rate, speed ratio, and cell concentration and see, to see how they affected uh, our printing outcomes. Uh, now we're going to bring it all together uh, with a fully fledged artifact to assess printability. <clears throat> and we're going to take another stab at uh, how the rheology relates to these outcomes. Uh, this study is also planned for publication soon uh, and is tentatively titled an exploratory study on the relationships between rheological properties and printability using a novel bioink specific artifact. <clears throat> so not many techniques have been developed to measure printability. Uh, in fact, this slide is pretty comprehensive uh, and each of these techniques have been developed recently. The main problems we have here uh, are that each of these measures only test the bioink in a very narrow way. Uh, we don't need our bio inks to do one of these things. We need them to be able to do all of them. Uh, the other problem is a lack of standardization. Uh, so far, most of these techniques haven't been adopted across different research groups, uh, which makes cross-study comparisons very difficult. Uh, other types of 3D printing have already tackled this issue which call, which is with what is called an artifact. So an artifact takes several commonly used or difficult to create features and combines them into a single print in order to test the printer or the material. Uh, the image here is an artifact from NIST and is an excellent example of how far behind our bioinks are compared to the rest of 3D printing. So we would fail miserably if we tried to print this structure with our bioinks. So for this study, uh, we've taken this same concept and dumbed it down a little bit to make it bioink specific. So we've talked about rheology a little bit previously, uh, but it's worth noting that this is the primary way uh, we characterize the flow behaviors of materials. Uh, in an ideal world, we would be able to use the characteristics uh, measured by rheology to predict our printing outcomes. And several studies have tried to do this, uh, and many different rheological measures have been implicated, including a bioinx viscosity, shear thing abilities, storage modulus, loss modulus, yield stress, tan delta, and various measures of a bioinx recovery ability. Uh, and part of the problem here is that it's not possible to modify one of these factors alone. Uh, we can modify a bioinx in various ways, but changing one almost always results in changes to, to others. And this is likely why previous experiments have been inconclusive, including the study which I presented first today. Uh, most simply take a single bo model bioinx and relate a single rheological measure to a single measure of printability. And the results therefore are only able to identify part of the picture and tend not to be applicable to other bioinks. So for this study, we wanted to catch a much wider net. Uh, we've looked at seven different bioinks. Uh, these were chosen in order to capture the full range of possible behaviors and outcomes. Uh, we've tested each of them both on the rheometer and the bioprinter, but in this case, uh, we've looked at both of these extensively, fully capturing both their rheological uh, behaviors and printing outcomes. So here is a list of all the outcomes that we've measured for the artifact. Um, I'm happy to talk about them in more detail if people are interested, uh, but we aren't going to cover all of the measurements today in the interest of time. Uh, you can see the five layer tubular structure uh, makes a reappearance as well as our crosshatch structure. Sorry, the laser pointer is really delayed. Um, and for this study, we've also added a five or a four angle turn accuracy and an overhang collapse structure, both of which uh, I'll talk about in more detail when we get to them. <clears throat> uh, so here's a first look at the wide range of uh, diverse outcomes captured by this group of bioinks. Jelma Jelangum here uh, serves as our non-uniform bioink. 40% uh, pleuronic serves as our gold standard bioink, uh, which is known to have really good printability. Uh, then we have decreasing uh, degrees of shape fidelity with laponite RD, laponite EP, 7% alginate, and finally, very poor 
bioinks in 8% methyl cellulose and 3% hyaluronic acid. And while we can see the differences from these images, uh, the results are also borne out in our quantitative data. Our best bioinks showed tube heights, uh, which were higher and more similar to the designed height, uh, as well as lower tube widths. They showed wall thicknesses, uh, which were lower, <clears throat> as well as higher radial accuracies. Uh, they also showed pores which were larger and square shaped. Uh, for turn accuracy, we printed bio inks um, with subsequently smaller and smaller uh, turn angles starting at 125 degrees to 90 to 55 to 20 degrees. Uh, we also use this longest single filament segment uh, for single filament analysis. Uh, using our uniformity, our uniformity ratio measure from the first study, <clears throat> uh, we see here that only our gel and gum jama presented non-uniform filaments. Uh, also, uh, most of the bioinks showed relatively uh, low errors for each turn uh, with error increasing with decreasing shape fidelity and our worst bioinks, 8% um, methylcellulose and 3% hyaluronic acid, uh, not even being able to be measured. Uh, for overhang collapse, uh, it's kind of hard to see here, um, but you can see where the hydrogel forms to each pillar and then remains unsupported uh, in between. So we printed these filaments uh, across narrower and narrower gaps, starting at 16 millimeters, eight millimeters, four, two, and one millimeters. Uh, our best bioinks showed the least amount of deflection. Uh, also, interestingly, uh, the overhang collapse structure was really useful for distinguishing between different bioinks at the highest or at the widest gap, which they were, they were able to span successfully. So it wasn't particularly useful if the bioinks failed at a given gap, and it also wasn't particularly useful at the lower gaps uh, because they didn't test the, it didn't test the limits of the biolink um, in a difficult uh, fashion. Uh, so moving on to the rheological measures, the first test we did was to look at the shear thinning <clears throat> abilities of each biolink. Uh, as, as expected, all biolinks showed some degree of shear thinning uh, with the our best bioinks, 40% uh, pleuronic and lapinite RD showing the highest viscosities at all shear rates. We can also measure the, we can also quantify the degree of shear thinning for each bioink by fitting to this, um, the power law equation uh, with uh, bioinks with a low N constant showing higher degree of shear thinning. <clears throat> and we also see 40% pleuronic and lapinite RD uh, with the lowest N constant. Okay. Uh, we also looked at storage modulus, loss modulus, and tan delta. Uh, the high shape fidelity bioinks both show particularly high uh, storage moduli. Although if we use, looked at storage modulus alone, uh, you might highly underestimate gel and gum gelma here. Uh, which performed admirably, probably closer to pleuronic and lapinite RD than it did lapinite EP, but it had a lower storage modulus than both lapinite EP and 7% alginate. Uh, loss modulus uh, generally didn't show any trend with printability for this bioinks, uh, with some really good bioinks, such as 40% pleuronic having high loss modulus, uh, lapinite RD having a medium. Um, loss modulus and gel and gum gelma having almost no loss modulus, uh, despite all showing good printability. Combining the two terms together with tan delta uh, paints a better picture, although if you only used tan delta, you might underestimate 40% pleuronic, which had only the third lowest tan delta despite having the best printability as measured by our artifact. Uh, you might also overestimate 3% hyaluronic acid, uh, which, despite performing similarly to 8% methyl cellulose, had a lower tan delta than 7% alginate. 
Uh, yield stress also tracks well with our printability outcomes, although similar to other measures, there are a few stark exceptions. Uh, for one, we might overestimate the difference between 40% uh, pleuronic and laponite RD, uh, which were actually very similar, although here 40% pleuronic has over twice the yield stress of laponite RD. Uh, additionally, we can't measure yield stress for all bioinks. Uh, in this study, we defined the yield stress as the point where the storage modulus and loss modulus intersect. And since 7% alginate has a higher loss modulus uh, to begin with, those two never cross over. Um, and we don't get a measure of yield stress, even though the printability outcomes were similar to laponite EP. And then really uh, starkly, 3% uh, hyaluronic acid had a higher yield stress even than 40% pleuronic, uh, despite performing miserably by all artifact measures. Uh, lastly, we looked at recovery. <clears throat> uh, as with other measures, the recovery ability of the bioink tracks well with printability with some exceptions. 40% uh, pleuronic and laponite RD both um, recover very quickly and near completely with greater than 90% of their viscosities recovered within three seconds. Uh, and then in decreasing amounts of recovery, we have 7% alginate, 8% methylcellulose, and 3% hyaluronic acid, which tracks well with our artifact data. However, we'd highly underestimate if we only looked at recovery, uh, gel and gum gelma and lapidite EP, which had low, the lowest recoveries uh, despite performing both performing better than 7% alginate on the artifact. <clears throat> um, so some of the conclusions that we can make from this data, uh, first with respect to the artifact, I think the results show it to be a really useful tool. Uh, it can be printed in only seven minutes at a typical print speed and only uses 0.4 milliliters of bioink. And both of these numbers uh, are for printing all four structures uh, in triplicate. Uh, the analysis can be a bit cumbersome since there are so many measures, uh, but we've also automated the image analysis portion of this process and plan to make the software uh, available to researchers for free. Uh, we also see that the artifact was very useful in detecting differences between bioinks. Uh, even the bioinks, which seemed very similar, such as 40% pleuronic and laponite RD, uh, as well as laponite EP and 7% alginate. Uh, we were able to detect differences between these bioinks using the artifact. <clears throat> uh, we can also identify quite clearly what the best bioinks look like from our data. Uh, the two best performing bioinks had a lot in common, including very high shear thinning abilities, high yield stress, high storage modulus, low tan delta, and a recovery behavior which was both quick and near complete. However, uh, no rheological parameter alone really gave us good insight into the relative printabilities between bioinks. Uh, this data outlines the problem of predicting printability a little better. Uh, beyond that, it also uh, clearly demonstrates for the first time that a more um, holistic view of a bioink rheolog rheological properties is needed. <clears throat> um, it's pretty rare currently to see a bioink characterization published that includes all four of these rheology tests, uh, but I think all four are necessary if we wanna start building rheological models which predict printing outcomes. And this data could potentially serve as a starting point for that task. Uh, I also think that the results demonstrate uh, clearly how we cannot yet infer printability from rheological measurements. Uh, in a way, um, while we would have preferred a nice and neatly packaged story about how we can predict printability using rheology, uh, this data actually ends up showing just how important the artifact is for uh, biolink development. <clears throat> uh, so for future work on the assessment methodologies, um, we plan to repeat our results at Maryland and Rice uh, to show that the artifact is reproducible both with different researchers and on different uh, bioprinters. We also want to formulate a print combined printability score uh, to make a simpler, like one line uh, result <clears throat> from the artifact. Uh, there's several improvements that we want to make to the image analysis software, uh, especially user ability, uh, since we plan to provide it to other researchers. Uh, we plan to apply the artifact to our own bioinformatics development process. 
uh, and take this same concept and um, apply it to other types of bioprinting, such as laser-based and inkjet. And lastly, uh, we think the results, both from the printing conditions and the real rheology studies, can serve as a good starting point for further model building. Okay, so we've finished up on the artifact development for now. Uh, I still think there's room for improvement, uh, but we'll have to save that for another day. Uh, and we explored again some of the different rheological factors at play. Uh, lastly, we are going to switch gears a bit and move away from printability and on to the biological properties. So this study is titled The Effect of BMP Medic Peptide Tethering Bioinks on the Differentiation of Dental Pulp Stem Cells in 3D Bioprinted Dental Constructs. And we've submitted this work to Biofabrication and it's currently under review. Craniofacial injuries and associated tooth loss are a significant health issue affecting millions of people both in the US and worldwide. Uh, artificial dental implants are the current gold standard treatment, uh, but these lack many of the properties of natural teeth and have several complications which can result in implant failure. From a regenerative medicine perspective, uh, bioengineered teeth have been proposed as a potential alternative treatment uh, for tooth loss. And in an attempt to manufacture these bioengineered teeth, researchers have used 3D bioprinting and a wide variety of cell types, biomaterials, and bioactive molecules. Uh, gelatin methacrylate, also known as gelma, is a hydrogel which can be easily synthesized from naturally derived gelatin. Uh, it can be easily extruded by the bioprinter and then UV cross-linked afterwards to provide structural integrity in long-term culture. While gelma does not have the best printability uh, based on our previous experiments, it does have relatively good printability and more importantly, it has, shown, uh, has been shown to have very good uh, general biological activity. And we can also modify this further, as you'll see, to target their regeneration of specific tissues. Bone morphogenic proteins, also known as BMPs, are the most commonly used growth factors to target the regeneration of bone and tooth tissues and have been shown to be capable of inducing osteogenic differentiation of stem cells. However, natural BMP peptides uh, are both expensive to manufacture and have a relatively short half-life in the body due to rapid degradation by proteinases. Uh, there's also some concern about their off-topic, off-target effects, uh, such as ectopic bone formation uh, in locations other than the implant site. To combat this, we have used a BMP mimetic peptide for this work. Uh, this peptide uses only a short amino acid sequence from the natural BMP molecule. Uh, this sequence is highly active during the osteogenic differentiation process. And the shorter sequence is much cheaper to manufacture and also significantly more stable. Uh, additionally, it can be further modified to conjugate to the methacrylate double bonds of gelma. And its short sequence allows for efficient chemical binding. So for this work, uh, we first bound the synthetic BMP to gelma and confirmed its stability. Uh, we then looked to see if the inclusion of this molecule affected the mechanical or biological properties of our gelma. And then lastly, we used uh, human-derived dental pulp stem cells, uh, which we got from wisdom teeth donations, to investigate the ability of BMP medic peptide to direct their differentiation. So we confirmed the methacrylation of the gelma via NMR spectroscopy <clears throat> and used 80% methacrylated gelma for this work. Uh, we looked at the gelma uh, stability over time by using a fluorescently labeled uh, peptide <clears throat> and measuring the fluorescent intensity over time. So the BMP peptide, which was not conjugated to gelma, dissipated out of the structures quickly uh, with over 50% gone by day seven and nearly all of it gone by day 28. However, the conjugated peptide was much more stable uh, with over 40% still remaining at day 28. Uh, none of the mechanical properties we measured showed any significant difference between the gelma with and without conjugated BMP. Uh, the storage modulus and Young's modulus were slightly lower <clears throat> uh, after cross-linking in the BMP gelma groups, and the swelling ratio was slightly higher, uh, although no statistical differences were detected. 
Uh, we think this might be due to the BMP taking up the same methacrylate double bonds uh, that are used for cross-linking, although a very small percentage of those. We bioprinted the gelma constructs and cultured them for up to 14 days. Uh, we confirmed their viability via live dead assay and greater than 90% of the cells were alive at all time points for both gelma only and BMP gelma groups. Uh, additionally, the cells uh, began to demonstrate a nice healthy spread morphology uh, over time. Uh, we also measured proliferation using an Almar blue assay and saw that the, uh, with no differences between the gelma and BMP gelma, um, that uh, absorbance increased up to 10 days. Uh, to investigate the effect of BMP on osteogenic differentiation of the cells, <clears throat> uh, we cultured gelma and BMP gelma in either normal or growth uh, osteogenic media. So normal growth media is just the typical uh, media that we use to culture cells, while osteogenic media uh, is a little bit cheating because there's not osteogenic media in the body, uh, but it contains many factors which will push the cells uh, to behave more bone, to behave more bone-like um, in their nature. We also looked at osteogenic media without dexamethasone, uh, which is a key um, osteogenic factor that is found in osteogenic media. Using H and E staining, uh, we see that our cellularity is good at both two and four weeks, uh, and that the spread of the cells uh, is maintained at both time points. We also conducted alizarin red staining uh, to look at calcium deposition. So alizarin red uh, stains calcium red, which is a key component of bone matrix. Uh, in none of, we don't see any calcium deposition at two weeks for any groups, although we see some calcium deposition for all groups at four weeks, except for the normal growth media gelma only condition. Uh, when we quantify these results, uh, we see <clears throat> that there is more calcium deposition in our BMP gelma groups than there are to the gelma only. Uh, this is both was increased in the normal growth media condition and in the osteogenic media condition with osteogenic media without dexamethasone falling somewhere in between. We also conducted immunohistological analysis uh, for key dental and bone markers. So DSPP uh, is an indicator of uh, dental expression and osteocalcin is an indicator of osteogenic expression. So uh, in these images here, red indicates uh, DSPP expression and green indicates osteocalcin expression. And again, when we quantify these results, we see similar trends uh, to the alizarin red staining <clears throat> with increased expression in our BMP gelma constructs. Uh, finally, quantitative real-time PCR was conducted to quantify the relative gene expression of osteogenic markers. Um, <clears throat> RUNCS2 here is an early marker of osteogenic differentiation, and this was raised in um, all of our osteogenic media conditions at two weeks, uh, which is before we were able to detect any staining results. Uh, collagen 1 <clears throat> is a osteogenic marker and is increased uh, in all of our BMP gelma groups relative to the, our gelma only groups. Uh, oste again, osteocalcin uh, shows similar trends as it did to the immunohistochemistry and alizarin red staining. And same with DSPP, uh, which is increased in our BMP gelma relative to gelma only groups. Um, so we have to order those slides wrong. <clears throat> so <laughs> based on this data, uh, we believe we can make several conclusions. Uh, first, the synthetic BMP peptide was successfully conjugated to gelma, and this did not hinder the bioink's mechanical properties, nor the cell's viability or ability to proliferate. Uh, next, the peptide was able to induce a slight amount of osteogenic differentiation at four weeks without the help of osteogenic media. 
and additionally, the peptide was able to synergistically increase the amount of differentiation when used in combination with osteogenic media. And we believe this strategy shows significant promise uh, for the future bone and tooth regeneration applications. <clears throat> and if, so for future work, um, we plan to conduct subcutaneous in vivo studies with this strategy on mice. Uh, we also want to improve the vascularization potential of our structures uh, by incorporating uh, pores and potentially as well a VEGF mimetic peptide and endothelial cells. Uh, eventually, these constructs will need to be load bearing. Uh, so we're thinking about uh, incorporating a stronger material such as PCL TCP. <clears throat> and we're taking the same uh, mimetic tethering peptide strategy and applying it to other tissues uh, such as cartilage with TGF beta. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so this slide always makes me a little bit sad because even though it was a lot of work, it doesn't look like much when you squeeze it all into a single slide. Uh, through this work, we have taken a multifaceted approach to improve the bioinks available for bioprinting. Uh, we've learned that the storage and loss modulus both contribute to a bioinks extrudability, shape fidelity, and uniformity for gelatin alginate bioinks. Uh, we've developed a fully fledged artifact and analysis method to quantify bioink printability. And we've used this artifact at various stages of development to look at the effects of cell density, printing conditions, and bioink rheology. And then lastly, uh, we have improved the biological activity of a gelma based bioink by conjugating it with a BMP medic peptide uh, to increase the osteogenic differentiation of dental pulp stem cells. Um, <clears throat> I have so many people uh, to thank for this work that it's incredible. Um, my advisor, Dr. Lee, is an awesome boss and an awesome mentor. And I actually enjoyed uh, being his student more and more as time went on, which I think is really saying something uh, because I think most PhD students have the opposite reaction to their advisors. Um, my committee, Drs. Almeida Prada, Goldstein, Scardall, and Tui have also been great. Um, they've been really patient with me and uh, given really great advice. Uh, I suspect they have some more of that really great advice waiting for me in a few minutes here. Um, I also owe a lot to Drs. Yu, Atala, Stitzel, and Brown, uh, as well as Ken Russell for bringing me to Wake Forest and providing me with this opportunity in the first place. Uh, pretty much all of this work has been funded by the NIH through the Center for Engineering Complex Tissues. Uh, we've had a great uh, we've had great collaborators across the board uh, as well. Our friends at Rice in Maryland uh, have helped with the artifact development um, and a ton of work was done by the bioinformatics department here at Wake, uh, getting the image analysis program off the ground and working. Uh, additionally, the bone tooth project in its entirety was done in collaboration with Dr. Yalek's group at Tufts. Uh, and they've been a huge help, uh, especially considering that here at WFIRM we hadn't had any experience uh, with dental tissues. Uh, you might think that I haven't done any work at all uh, by looking at the length of this list, and I'm sure it's not comprehensive, um, but a lot of my lab mates have helped me at some point along the way. Um, everything from training me on various lab techniques to um, informal conversations about my projects uh, to even working directly on them in some form or another. Uh, in particular, uh, Ji Hoon Park, Brett Gao, and Albert Hahn uh, deserve shout outs for the work they did directly on a lot of the data I presented today. Uh, Ji Hoon Park for the dental study, uh, Brett Gao, a summer student who worked on the uh, first printability uh, tan delta study, and then Albert Hahn, who did a lot of the experiments on the um, cell concentration and printing conditions. Um, and of course, <clears throat> uh, no PhD defense would be complete without the friends and family malentage. Um, moving to a new city where I didn't know a single soul was surprisingly difficult for me. Uh, and these great people have really made life enjoyable outside of work. <clears throat> uh, I'm surprised how many of them are on the call today. Uh, so I'm really glad I included this slide. Um, <laughs> if you guys haven't fallen asleep yet, uh, thanks for being awesome and for always forgiving me when I've bailed on plans to go work in the lab. And lastly, uh, I'm really grateful for my family. I can't thank them enough. 
Uh, I know they're really proud of me, uh, but if it weren't for them being such great parents and grandparents and siblings, uh, I wouldn't have had this opportunity in the first place. And Allie, uh, you know I'm not much of a declare my love in front of an audience type, um, but I love you. <laughs> and, and thank you uh, for, <laughs> for putting up with me, uh, even in the dark days of dissertation writing, and also for being the sole object of my quarantine restlessness. 